um, and welcome back to day two of the National Parent Center uh, Conference. Um, my name is Stephanie Moss, and I am one of your presenters today for this session. The DEC recommended practices are for families, too. Um, we are just going to introduce ourselves. Um, again, my name is Stephanie Moss. I work at Parent to Parent of Georgia, and I also do some work for the Early Childhood Technical Assistance Center out of um, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. You'll hear a little bit more about them today as we go forward. Um, Mai, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Mai Hall. I am the Early Childhood Specialist at the PTI in Maryland, the Parents Place of Maryland. Brenda? Hi, I'm Brenda Lincoln. I'm the Executive Director of West Virginia Parent Training and Information. Hi everyone, this is uh, Deepa Srinivasavaradhan from SPAN Parent Advocacy in New Jersey. Um, I'm the parent, DEC Recommended Practices Ambassador and CDC's Learn the Science Act, uh, Act Early Ambassador to our state. We're glad to see all of you and have you here with us today. So we're going to start with um, um, a little bit about what we hope to accomplish today. Um, we want to um, in this hour and 15 minutes that we have with you, we want to help you become familiar with the DEC recommended practices and um, a suite of resources that were developed from the Early Childhood TA Center to help families use the recommended practices. We want you to understand how to access and use those resources and to think about some really practical ways that you can take this information and use it as part of your ongoing work in your parent center. So we're going to spend a lot of time with just some real life examples and scenarios that will hopefully, you know, give you some great um, ideas to think about next. So it's time for a poll. We're going to just see who's in the room. But it looks like we have a majority of PTI SIPR staff. A couple of project, not oh, one project director and one other. So thank you for sharing that. Now we know who our audience is. I will close that. All right. Okay, so we're going to quickly give you just a little bit of background and information to help you understand what we're talking about here. So the DEC recommended practices is what we're talking about. And we're going to start with what is DEC? Um, DEC is the Division of, for Early Childhood of the Council for Exceptional Children. So this is a huge international organization that is really the voice for early intervention and early childhood special ed. So we think about, if you think about, for example, speech language pathologists have a speech, uh, an organization for them, and physical therapists have an organization for, the, for PTs. This is really the voice for early intervention and early childhood special ed, but their members are so much bigger than that. They have members that are practitioners and, um, and higher ed faculty, technical assistance providers, program administrators, and most, most importantly to all of us, parents and family members. And they primarily exist to work with and on behalf of young children birth to eight with disabilities or other special health care needs in their families. And so you might go, well, what does that do for families? How does that help families? And so the, again, they, um, their, their mission really is to promote policies and practices that support um, families in help making sure that their children enhance, have optimal development, who um, make, have the best possible outcomes. And so not only do they promote policies and practices, but they do a lot of work around guidance and technical assistance and training and support so that not only do we know what works, but how to do it and how to implement that with young children and their families so that they can have those better outcomes. And um, the DEC recommended practices actually an initiative that started back in 1991, um, and it was an, an effort to really I'll read the thing to bridge the gap between research and practice. So lots of research going on, but how do you turn that into everyday practice and day to day with families and children. So in 1991, they um, undertook this initiative to come up with what the recommended practices were so that they could really inform services and inform quality uh, for children with disabilities and their families. 
um, they really do represent like the biggest bang for your buck, the highest leverage, the biggest impact practices that practitioners can do. So again, first happened in 1991. In 2000, the, um, they received a grant from OSEP, which helped them to um, continue to enhance those and update them. And then in, from like 2012 to 2014, they, um, and, uh, um, underwent another round of revisions and they really they formed what they called a recommended practices commission that included a lot of family members and um, some and more focus groups and more input from the field um, and then that's where ECTA came in and began working with them um, on a most recently revised round of recommended practices which were released in 2014 and those practices actually address there are 66 practices and they address eight topic areas. And so you see the list there of the topical areas. Um, we're gonna, in a few minutes, you're actually gonna get a chance to see some of those and see what those look like. But they're, they cover all those areas. And um, for example, under the category of leadership, there's, there's 14 different practices um, that they've identified and addressed with technical assistance and guidance on what it looks like and how to implement it and how to make it happen. So perhaps the most exciting thing to us about the DEC recommended practices and the efforts that have been made to spread the word and share information about it is the creation of what are called RP ambassadors. So about four years ago, um, the first cohort of ambassadors were um, recruited and trained. These are individuals across the country who are um, involved in higher education and the provision of technical assistance, primarily um, most of them were either in like colleges and universities or state early intervention, early childhood special ed systems. The first round was, and their role was to take the recommended practices, really share information about them, promote the use of them, and, and use them to hopefully raise awareness and improve services and systems for young children. Um, last year, the second cohort of ambassadors was launched, and we are super excited that at that time there were 10 family ambassadors selected to do the same work, to promote awareness of the practices, to um, try to use them to improve systems and services and get them in the hands of families. We've had so many conversations about how these practices in the hands of families help them be much better prepared for what to expect from their child's intervention and how to um, really be an equal partner contributing to everything that's going on in the decision making for their child. So, my co-presenters today are all three new family ambassadors. So um, you're gonna hear from them in just a minute and um, a lot of interesting work that's going on. If you are curious about whether or not you have an ambassador in your state or near to you, if you were to go to the Early Childhood TA Center's website, you see ECTA, we're gonna give you a list of links at the very end of the presentation. So um, it's not on these slides, but you will see them. You would go to Early Childhood Technical Assistance Center. You would then be able to, you could search for the ambassadors and you would be able to, um, oops, I'm so sorry. You would be able, sorry. You would be able to select meet the ambassadors and you would see something like this um, image of the, the, the video or the photos here of the ambassadors. You can learn a little more, more about them, where they work and who they're working with so that you could see if you have one, in, like I said, in your state or near to you. So the next thing we wanna do is show you a really short little video on um, how to introduce the recommended practices to families. Um, we think this is a great way to just kind of start the conversation. And if you're thinking about, if you're still kind of sitting there in your chair going, okay, I still don't get it. I don't quite understand what I do with this and how I make this real for the families I'm working with. We're gonna do, we're gonna show you this video. So it's gonna take me just a second to click off and share and all that, but I'm gonna try to get this right. Practices level the playing field. The recommended practices have value for families because they communicate our field of practice and what you should expect to be encountering as you're interacting with practitioners who are part of our field. I think it's a great resource for families because if you can walk into an IFSP for an IEP conference and you can say, this is what I'm looking for for my child. I want to see this happening in this program. And the reason I want to see it is because this is what the research tells us should be happening. That, that is really a tool for families to use to advocate for their child, to advocate for higher quality programs, whether it's at the classroom level, the state level, whatever level. When families understand 
and what the provider can bring to them and how the provider can support them and their families, I think they will be more likely to see it as a partnership and you're working together with me to help me and my family. But I have a role to play in that. It's not you're coming in to help us, fix us, take care of it. The new recommended practices will help families really understand what their choices are, not just in terms of choices of placement or in choices of what the goals are going to be, but choices in what are they going to do in their interaction with their child to support their child. And I feel like these practices are going to make that conversation much more concrete and hopefully more successful. The leadership strand in the DEC recommended practices is critical for families to understand how they can utilize the recommended practices to become the best leader for their own child as they move through the different systems. In those early years as a family, you're feeling your way. And you don't know quite what you can do and how you can do it. So many of us feel that when we've gotten to a certain point, we have something to say. Uh, and how are we going to say it? Whether it's about our own child or it's joining caring organizations or state level work groups or going to conferences. And I think the recommended practices can give you that voice and give you direction. The new recommended practices are written in a way that allows us to easily be able to share with families what their choices are in a very personal way. If I know what you can bring to me, I think it'll help me more as a family be able to support my own family. Because if you were in birth to three, then three years on. If you're in three to five, when we go to kindergarten, you're not there anymore. But that baby's mine for a long time. So what we'd like to do now is to actually move into getting started with the recommended practices. Um, as, as I mentioned, the Early Childhood Technical Assistance Center, again, they're at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, and they really take the lead around the ambassador project. They've developed some amazing resources. They're all available free. You can download them. You can access them you know, in a number of different ways. They support practitioners and families in there. And there's quite a few of them in um, English and Spanish as well. So um, they are a great, um, some great resources. And Maya is going to take us through um, kind of a look at what exists and what those, what those are and how we might begin to use them. Oh, next slide. Okay. All right, so when you get up on the website, we do have the website listed at the very end under the resources slide. So when you do get a chance to hop on the website, you'll see the ECTA and all of these practice improvement tools. They've done a fantastic job to help increase your skills as practitioners to help you plan for interventions and some self-reflection using these evidence-based practices. This practice guide, so you see performance checklists, and it also lists and translates it into Spanish. You'll see practice guides for practitioners and practice guides for families. These practice guides for families are also translated into Spanish for ease of use. These practice guides for practitioners are intended to help us know how we know our practices are actually working. And there's also on the left side under tools by type, you will see if you select that, you can see a product selection tool, which helps you search for a specific professional development, development module or a specific practice guide if you're unsure of what even where to start. If you have a topic in mind, type it in the toolbox to search and it should bring up some different types of suggestions on what to read first. Next slide. Once you click on, for example, a practitioner, oh yes, and the website is in the chat, I see. So for example, if you click on the link that says practitioner guides, you'll see a sam this sample practice practice guide called Teaming and Collaboration, 
you'll see at the top it says practitioner practice guide one of three. So that means there are three of these and they're on the same topic, but they list kind of a different perspective on how to look at these. Next, you'll see the description of practice. They've all been done for ease of use, so they all look the same. You'll always see a blue box at the top, which lists a little description. You'll see a video link right there, which links you to a short two to four minute video on YouTube, which are fantastic. If you ever want to see cute little babies playing with each other, this is the place for you. You'll see performing, performing the practice, what to do. And then you'll see an illustrative vignette that lists anywhere from infants, toddlers, to preschool age children. And it lists what do practitioners, what are some suggestions for practitioners to do? And how do you recognize success? How do you know that what you're doing is actually working? You'll see a little bit of bullets on the bottom to see, just to give you a little guidance on how to know that this task is working for you. Next slide. Now the fantastic thing, they've worked really hard to make it applicable and inclusive to as many practitioners as fa and families as possible. So it is usable on a mobile device. And I actually tried this. I went on my phone, I typed in ECTA Center, and I touched all these little buttons. And as technolo technologically deficient as I am, if I can figure it out, so can you. So. When you go on the website, everything works. You're able to view, download, and print these practice guides, and you can still watch these videos. Next slide. So we're gonna have one of our fantastic presenters go over a scenario with you. Thank you, Mai. So now we get to the fun part, um, the, the best part about how these recommended practices can be used in our day-to-day -day work with, within our parent centers. I know as parent center staff, we experience uh, you know, a lot of these um, situations uh, from uh, where we receive calls from families asking how um, uh, for information about what they should know and what to expect uh, for an upcoming meeting, whether it's with their early intervention program or with their um, school district um, or with another service provider. So, um, so I think the, this scenario is um, really perfect in that regard. Um, so I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes to actually read through the scenario, um, which you may all be very familiar with, um, as I said. Um, can you go back to, yeah, thank you. Um, and I will also try to um, read the scenario um, as, as we're, I'm waiting for you all to catch up on um, reading. So Bryce's mother, Sharon, called the parent center in her state asking for assistance preparing for Bryce's upcoming evaluation for Part C, early intervention eligibility. She stated, I just received a call from the health department in regard to my son's hearing loss. The early intervention program staff are coming to our house Monday, but I'm not sure what to expect. My son is 14 months old. She went on to describe how Bryce is currently making sounds and communicating. She asked how she could prepare for the evaluation and what information she could share. She also asked for suggestions of ways she could support Bryce's language development at home during their everyday activities. So as I said, this might be a very familiar situation for you and you may have a lot of information and resources to share with families um, when they call with similar questions. But I'm just going to walk us through um, how the recommended practices could be um, helpful for you in your work um, to share with families. Next slide, please. So we have, um, so we have two layers um, that we need to address. One is the information that the parent needs to um, understand what to expect at the meeting and so she and to prepare herself to participate in that meeting. And then the second part is about her requesting information about activities that she could do with her child. So the first um, resource, if you see, uh, um, I mean, first um, 
um, resource to support the scenario, if you could um, see that, is the um, assessment related recommended practice that talks about how the um, parent could be an equal partner with the assessment team by sharing in, you know, how she may be able to share the information that she has gathered about her own child because she already expressed that she has been um, collecting information about how uh, her child communicates. Um, so maybe you know that's important information and helping her um, see that that's valuable information and she's the um, um, best knowledgeable person about her child um, and giving her ways um, and tools that she can share that information with the team um, you know is really important so she feels that she's an equal participant in that meeting. And, and we know this practice is working and the best part for, is that it also helps the families to understand that this practice is working when they know that um, face, um, when they know that the team is incorporating the parents' suggestions into the plan, um, when um, a plan is developed that would meet the needs of, her, of the parents um, of the child, then the parent can be um, confident. We often have parents coming to us and saying, well, uh, you know, I tried to participate in the meeting, but I'm not sure, um, you know, whether what the team is up to or what the team is planning for. So, um, so just, you know, as we're trying to empower the parents, it's important to share re the recommended practices because it lays out very clearly for the family with, a, with an example similar to their um, situation. If you see um, the quick peek section on this page really shows the, a similar scenario of a parent getting prepared for an IFSB meeting. So, um, so I think that is really very helpful for families to see. Next slide, please. So there's a um, video about how a parent may be able to partner with their um, child's assessment team. Do you want to play that video, Stephanie? So in addition to the um, practice guide uh, for families, I, um, we feel that the videos are wonderful because um, it's very easy for parents to learn from a video and um, understand this, um, the steps that they need to take to become part of their um, child's assessment team um, and how they may be uh, able to collaborate with them. Um, so we have more resources to support the scenario. So like, um, so we are now talking about the next part of the um, uh, question um, or the reason for the parents call to the parent center. So um, again, 
um, DEC has these um, wonderful um, activities uh, based on the recommended practices um, around environment and instruction that families could use as everyday activities for their children. Again, there's a, um, there's a you know, video connected with each of these um, activities showing parents how they may be able to do, implement those activities. And there's also the fun part of um, reviewing the activity and um, there's, a, there's a neat pop quiz that pops up at the end of the uh, uh, end of each video. So they're very brief videos and then it'll be a fun activity to answer those uh, one or two uh, couple of questions and also to help your families to answer those questions as uh, you know to help with um, better understanding and relating um, to the situation. And we selected this one in Spanish. So there is a question, um, how is the mother supporting her son's learning? And then there are um, four options listed. So based on the understanding or, or what the parent has seen in the video, the parent or, or you as the person that's supporting the family um, can help the family answer um, this question and submit your response to see if you were on, you know, if you were on the um, uh, right track. I'm sorry, I'm not able to see the video clearly, but I mean, um, but when you click a couple of answers, again, it shows what are the right responses and um, what the video was actually emphasizing. So, so these are cool videos attached to each of the activities that are listed under the recommended practices. And, okay. and so we have all these great um, resources. It's just um, making sure that families are aware and sharing with them. Um, and not, you know, sometimes we look for um, uh, activities to share with families. These are all um, research-based and evidence-based practices and activities. So, you know, we don't have to um, uh, think twice as, as we're trying to share these out with families. Sorry, I'm taking more time. Thank you. So we're going to take a look at another scenario, kind of completely different. Um, in this scenario, we're, we're trying to help you think about the different roles that we play in each of our parent centers. So I'm going to read this one to you. You may be reading it silently as well. Steve works for the parent center in his state and is responsible for the center's website and their social media presence. He's preparing a calendar of information and material that will be shared using various forms of technology over the next six months. And he notices that he's lacking content, really good, he needs some more good content, and he just needs more, right, that focuses on early childhood. How could he use the recommended practices and the various resources and tools as he continues planning? So we wanna help you look at the recommended practices and think about ways to do some of that. So here's, here's a first example, and there's a lot of words on this slide, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna read them all to you, but one example or one thing that Steve might do is, for example, select, um, a topic to highlight each month. So he might say, you know, for our parent center, we're, April is assessment month, and we are going to focus on how to prepare for your child's assessment. And each of the weeks in April, he might just pick one tip or one um, activity off of the, one of the practice guides and use that as a, um, a social, a Facebook post with, you know, a picture or a video clip or you know, um, something like that. So we, there's such good, rich content on those um, practice guides that, you, that you, you, could, you could have a year's worth of content without any trouble. He might, so again, you see week one, identify ways to share information about your child with team members. Um, share videos of your child participating in activities. How many, of the, how many times have we talked to families and they kind of know that they should share information about their child, but we might suggest, hey, just take a short video. Use your phone and do a little video of your child during mealtime so that the 
you know, the provider can see or the team members can see how she does during mealtime and what's hard and what's easy for her. Um, so again, use those sort of things like look at week four, make a list of your child's strengths. Um, what, write down the things that make him excited that he likes to do, that he prefers to do. Probably write down the things that he doesn't like to do too. But helping families think about those really simple, really concrete things they can do is going to help them be prepared to be much more engaged in that assessment process. Other um, suggestion that Steve might consider based on some of the tools that we've looked at today, we've shown you a couple of video clips already. Um, he could embed video clips from the practice guides in social media posts or on his website. He could link to the recommended practices and the tools from the website or from social media. Some centers, I know some parent centers use text messaging to communicate with families. So how, um, how fun would it be to do like a tip of the day or a tip of the week if, if daily seems a bit much to families um, based on the recommended practices and the practice guides. Again, nobody has to create any of this content that already exists for you. You've just got to figure out how you want to repackage it and put it out there. Um, and then if you do, a, if, you're, if your center does a newsletter, whether it's a monthly newsletter or quarterly or whatever you do, you could highlight one recommended practice per month in your newsletter um, in a special section. You might just create a section in your newsletter on early childhood um, and, and highlight a recommended practices in there each time that you do an issue of the newsletter. Okay. That's me. I unmuted. It's all working. Okay, scenario three. I'm just going to read it to you. Feel free to read it as well. This is a different one. It focuses on families. So Lonnie is writing a training curriculum for parents of children ages zero to five with disabilities or suspected disabilities. She has to think of parent-friendly resources that are evidence-based and easy to use. She understands that the implementation of evidence-based practices creates positive outcomes for families of children with disabilities. How can she utilize the recommended practices in her curriculum to engage her families in a rich discussion? Next slide. So the first thing that comes to mind is there is a recommended practice titled family. And part of that is you can look at the Family Practice Guide, Parent Provided Child Learning Opportunities, they're all titled something different. So you look for the one that calls to you in what you want to accomplish. So I was thinking as a whole group discussion during this curriculum, because parents love discussing things about their children. And this is of course after a lot of introductions have been done, after you set the tone for the type of environment you want to teach your class in. So part of a whole group discussion, ask parents to give you examples and write it down on a piece of chart paper as to what are they already doing when you play with your child. How do you play with your child? Give me some examples of how you play with them in the house, outside of the house. And as you write them down, parents will start to feel encouraged and validated that what they're actually doing can be found in these practice guides. So when we honor and validate what parents know and the type of skills they have and what they bring to the table, this is a great way to build relationships and inclusivity. Next slide. Other resources to support a family-based curriculum is to watch that video. So this video is from that link from the last slide. We'll see an example of a little girl learning to play patty cake and how this provider encourages the parent. So pay attention to types of questions you might wanna ask your families after they watch this video and we can watch it right now.
Does it have to go back to the beginning? Don't hear the volume. Is there volume with this? Okay, Stephanie, they can't hear. There is volume with this, so I'm wondering why it's not showing. Oh, there you go. Add it and mark it with the beep and put it in the oven for baby and me. Yay! <laughs> So that ended on a good note. Um, these videos are really good examples of what it could look like. And it's really encouraging for brand new parents in this early intervention process to see what it could look like. It also encourages parents who are already in the process to kind of guide their conversations around positive thinkings maybe to build that relationship with their practitioner, to be open to what the practitioner has to say, and to create that reciprocal relationship that should be happening. So you can always ask parents after they watch this video, what did you observe? Would you do anything different? What would you do the same? Just general questions. And that summarizes up my scenario. And now we have another to share with you. Thank you, Maya. 
uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present about leadership today. I would like to take this time to share our ideas as well as this provides as well as provides the recommended practices concerning leadership to include families. Leaders in early intervention and early childhood special education can consist of program directors, administrators, parents and caregivers, grandparents, higher education, etc. No one category operates in a silo. As many of our attendees are leaders themselves, this will be a great sharing experience. Okay, so we are now on scenario four, and I'm going to go ahead and read this to you all. Joe is the executive director of the Parent Training Center in his state. He has the leadership responsibilities of guiding and advocating for the center. There is a state meeting before the legislative session to discuss the new and revised policies about early childhood services. As he is preparing for the meeting, he notices lack of vital data to support the needs in the state's snapshot toward improving the services for all children and families. How could he use his resources and skills for the parent center at this level meeting based upon the recommended practices? Okay, um, and again, there are uh, recommended practices and skills that are required and needed to be completed by a leader at the front line. And we'll go to that next slide. Okay, um, and these are some of the resources that will support this uh, scenario for and uh, right this one second. Oh, he is uh, Joe is advocating and promoting the importance of early intervention and early childhood services and supports at the state level meeting that we will learn more about other resources. Now, some of the leadership includes working with others and uh, the other leaders and stakeholders at all levels to raise funds, set new rules and plan new initiatives for young children and families. At the local level, leaders may work across community agencies. Leaders need to advocate for and secure the, the fiscal and human resources needed to provide quality services and supports. Leadership involves using data to make informed decisions toward improving services. Okay, and we'll go on to the next slide. Now, the vision and direction of Joe's leadership is part of a checklist. Okay, there's the checklist, you will see. And this is also on the website, the ECTA, which you have the, uh, the link to that has been provided. Now, some of the things in this that you would, uh, the leadership practice that would be working with the leader would be to advocate and secure the fiscal and human resources needed, again, to provide quality services and supports, communicates how the agency fits into the larger service system, seeks and supports opportunities to work with leaders to promote services and supports for all children and families. Now, it's a little hard to see because it is tiny print and uh, uh, me, I have a hard time seeing anyway, but if you would look at number eight up close, it's where you will, uh, you will reach family leaders that can help Joe and the parent training center leader to advocate and promote, promote for the importance of early intervention. Now, just imagine when we're talking about bringing families into this, if we had several family leaders who came prepared to tell their story at this meeting, what an excellent way to reach the members of the meeting with awareness and input by policy by families sharing their personal experiences. And while we are talking about that, I do know personally that this is a tried and true way that will work. Recently, I was asked to speak on the Hill uh, to my state senators and congressmen during the special education conference. And we, they asked me to speak about special education services and how they affect our children and families here in West Virginia. And I actually shared some personal stories with them. I briefly, I will tell you that I spoke about an 80 year old grandmother who was raising her four grandchildren and they were all ages 12 and under due to her daughter being incarcerated. And uh, she had received a letter from the school that uh, they needed her to come in for a meeting and she didn't understand. She actually thought the school had misspelled a word. Uh, she said they wanted to talk to her about a pie. And so this was early one morning and I said, and I didn't understand what she was wanting. So I said, well, let's sit down and talk about this and we'll figure this out together. So I asked her the color of the form that this was on. 
And when she told me, I realized it was an IEP form and that, uh, you, you know, she wasn't sure exactly what this was. So I tried to explain a little bit to her. Well, she said she was doing well to get these four grandchildren fed and out the door. And she didn't know if any of her grandchildren had anything going on with them, such as a disability, because I mentioned and asked her if there's any, you know, any of her the grandchildren had any issues. So, but anyway, to make this long story short, uh, West Virginia Parent Training attended the meeting with her. We got this resolved. She found out her youngest grandson has a learning disability, and we were able to get supports in place to help the child. And, uh, I mean, it was a good ending to this. And also, when I was talking to them about the needs of the students with disabilities and the parents and families and how difficult it is to get some of these in, the individual needs of the child met at times, everybody that, that was, you know, during these meetings, they were taking notes and, and this and that. And finally, I just paused and I said, you know, I was talking about how difficult it is for parents. And I stopped and I said, I'm one of those parents. I said, I have struggled. I said, you know, when my son was in early uh, educa elementary education, I said, I, I would cry almost every day. And it was just like at that moment when they felt that personal connection and interaction, everybody quit taking notes and I had all eyes upon me. So, uh, you know, I was truly the leader at that moment. And I could tell that they were generally interested in relating to my words. So personal stories are what leaders truly want to hear at all levels. And they want to hear not just the data and facts, even though those are, even though those are important as well. Shared experiences from connections and support with uh, professionals at the meetings. Uh, the personal stories help involve families so they can identify the need. And it also shows the human need for the system of services and supports that from the, with the division of early childhood. The next slide, please. Okay, uh, as we reflect back on our scenario, we will go over the steps needed to uh, be completed by the DEC leadership structure. And that would be to introduce, again, DEC to the meetings, stakeholders, and legislative connections, share the prepared issue briefs, ideas with goals, clear goals outlined, and these will be prepared normally when you go into this type of meeting at this level. They, these are already shared with everybody at the meeting. Uh, network and advocate for policies and resources that promote the implementation of the DEC position and statement papers. Establish partnerships across levels, national, state, and local, with counterparts in other systems and agencies for opportunities to coordinate inclusive systems of services and supports. And again, you know, um, Point out anything that needs added to the leadership checklist and creating an equity climate and culture. Find, finding leaders within a families that we work with. We have so many families that would be excellent leaders. They just need our support to get them you know, started and going on. And um, my last sentence on this would be the, the essence of great leadership is influence, not authority. Thank you. So um, we have seen a lot of uh, scenarios, um, I mean, all, almost at least four of them for now. Um, and uh, I think we wanted to come up with a scenario like this um, specifically because we wanted to make it relatable for you, more relatable for you in your everyday work. Um, we um, thought that this scenario uh, is helpful because we're always, uh, as parent center staff, in this position to um, to communicate with other colleagues within our own parent center as well as with other partners in our state about um, the things that we have learned or the things that we want them to um, start using and sharing with families. So I'll read the scenario quickly while you, or you're all trying to read for yourselves. Um, Jane works for the parent center in her state that houses a wide array of projects and programs to support families with children with and without special health care needs. She has the opportunity to share the information about the recommended practices with other project staff at her center and work with other programs and partners in her state. She is looking for ways to model how the recommended practices can be used and shared through their work with families and professionals. What can she do and which resources and tools can she use? Next slide, please. 
so I try to break it down into two parts. So the first um, part, I call it example one, and I'm trying to give an example of how Jane might be able to collaborate with another project team within her center. Um, so I know there's a lot of words on the slide, but I'm just going to try and break it down for you. Um, so of course, the first step would be to introduce the um, deck and um, the uh, deck recommended practices to the uh, to the other project staff so the jane could do that by sharing a flyer or um, sharing some of the informational videos that are on the deck website um, one of which the you know was one of the initial videos that we um, shared with you um, and then you know to delve a little deeper jane could schedule a separate session with that project um, team to introduce and review the practice guides. So, um, um, you know, you could probably use the slides that we use today to um, introduce the practice guides and what DEC is and what deck recommended practices are to your um, colleagues. Um, and use the, uh, really use the pop quiz too to help with um, better understanding for them um, and um, you know, so they can improve um, improve on the goals for their own project. Here, I took the example of a project at our parent center. It's called the Inclusive Childcare Project. So their goal is to improve early childhood inclu inclusion of children with disabilities. So you can kind of help them um, understand how these recommended practices can be helpful um, to enhance that goal. Um, and you could stop at that and the project team might be able to um, take that information and run with it. But if you want to, you know, go a little bit further and try to help them, um, you know, really uh, understand how they can share with other professionals and families, or if you um, uh, think there is an opportunity to collaborate with them on a presentation to um, you know, some of the professionals that you are trying to reach as well. Um, so I um, came up with this idea of a presentation to childcare providers. So that's the third bullet that's explaining that part. Um, so childcare providers, um, the inclusive childcare is trying to highlight the important role of childcare staff in monitoring child development and connecting families to early screening and early intervention services for young children. So, um, so again, you know, you could collaborate on that presentation and help the other project staff share the recommended uh, practices with the childcare um, providers, show how the practice guides work, use a performance um, checklist that could be helpful and for the child care center staff to increase their understanding on not only the understanding of the recommended practices, but also um, a self-evaluation of the use of um, the practices, um, where they currently stand and how they could make uh, improvements in that area. And again, I listed the pop, pop quiz as another way to engage the child care providers. Next slide, please. Um, so the second part, you know, so we talked about how you could collaborate with a project team within your parent center. So this part talks about um, how you could introduce it to a team of stakeholders at a statewide meeting um, where there are both parents and professionals. Um, so the goal of the meeting could be to discuss the needs of children and youth with special health care needs, um, identify gaps and barriers and access to care, and plan activities to support families. So um, deck um, RPs could be um, shared with the meeting attendees, of course, by sharing flyer and informational videos, but also sharing the family and uh, teaming and collaboration practice guides, you know, might be really helpful in this situation. So, um, um, so the stakeholders also understand the important role that families could play in, um, uh, in um, guiding the discussion and planning the activities to address the gaps and barriers. Um, so again, introducing performance checklists um, to promote collaboration, motivation, 
guidance, vision, and direction leadership. These checklists are all readily available. Um, and I posted all the links to the performance checklist to in the chat. Um, and they're also available at the end of the presentation. So, um, so you could leave it at that and, you know, stakeholders might be, um, you know, you willing to use that in their day-to-day um, -day work. But the next step is also very important as you network and make um, new connections with um, partners who may be interested in exploring a little bit more um, uh, or who may want more information. So you may be able to share additional um, information and see um, if there are any ways uh, in which you can collaborate to support um, families um, you know, in using the recommended practices or sharing recommended practices with families. Um, maybe the partner that you're talking to uh, is also working with the same target audience. So, um, you know, that might be a um, good way to um, try to align, um, you know, some of the goals and activities um, with them that would also include using the uh, recommended practices. I think that wraps up my scenario. Um, and we are on to questions, comments, and next steps. OK, thank you, Deppa. Um, we're on questions, comments, and next steps. So uh, if anybody that has been listening has any questions or comments, please add them in the chat. We would be ha happy, happy to answer anything we can. And we, you've had all four of us here to help you if you have any questions. So, and anyway, now that you have seen some examples of how recommended practices and resources could be used by a parent center, we'd love to hear what your thoughts are and if you have any plans for using the resources that you'd be willing to share with us and share with each other. So, I mean, if you have anything that you're thinking about or maybe have an idea that's kind of coming into your mind, if you'd like to share those, we, you know, we'd love to hear them. And also, if there are any uh, people who come, uh, come to mind that you plan to share these resources with in, in the near future, maybe perhaps a training or something for families or, you know, or professionals. And is there anything else that you can, that, oh, okay. I, Sorry. I, I, that's okay. And is there anything else that you need to begin using the DEC recommended practices and related services? So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask. Well, and I was just going to say, we have a fairly small group, so if our um, tech folks can unmute everybody, I think we'd be okay, too, but we just wanted to talk, too, because we have a, we have a, a few minutes, um, if, it's, if you can do the chat or the unmute, so, um, and, and just speak up. Well, this is Pat Cameron from Massachusetts, and hello, fellow ambassadors, um, and um, it's very timely because on Thursday, um, in Massachusetts, we have a Department of Early Education and Care, which does child care and early childhood. Um, and then we have the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed, which is kindergarten and up. Well, we're meeting on, the Parent Center is meeting on Thursday with the commissioner from the Department of Early Education and Care. And we want to bring this to her attention as um, a resource for her child care field. Um, and, you know, particularly family child care, uh, where, uh, you know, they can recommended resources, recommended practices can be a wonderful resource in just learning more about child development and how to communicate with families and really supporting a child's um, healthy development. Thanks, Pat. You know, it's interesting that that we ask ourselves this question, like, what's going on right now, and what do you want? What are you going to do with this information? In Georgia, I just got an email today about a new Act Early stakeholder group that's been like being led by our Department of Early Care and Learning, kind of looking at COVID implications and child find and all of those things. And so, you know, you're exactly right, Pat. It's very timely. Talking about this today just makes me go, oh my goodness, I know exactly, you know, how I want to approach that meeting, um, you know, in a few weeks. So it's just, it's, it's, I think it's a lot of great resources that are applicable to a lot of the work that just keeps kind of landing on our plates, right? Yeah. 
Anybody else have ideas about what you're going to do or just questions for us? We're going to give you our contact information at the end, too. So if you think of ideas or questions later, you can certainly um, reach out to us. So while we're waiting for folks to chime in, I just thought, um, you know, another um, way um, here in New Jersey that I'm trying to um, share the recommended practices. Um, you know, I just uh, recently got um, selected to participate in the preschool learning uh, and teaching standards update committee. Um, so we're planning to um, get together to tomorrow actually to talk about, um, you know, whether we want to um, just make minor revisions to our preschool learning standards or if we want to, you know, make a full revision. So um, as a member of that uh, committee, I think, you know, there's really uh, a, an important uh, um, role that the deck recommended practices could play. So I'll be definitely sharing it with that group and looking at the recommended practices as we are um, trying to make revisions to our preschool learning and teaching standards. Okay, well, how about we do this? We're gonna move on to the next slide, but if you think of questions or comments, just again, chime in um, and or put it in the chat. So again, um, I, I, I know all of you are all trying to take in all of this information. Um, so we thought it would be helpful to share a smart action plan worksheet with you. Um, so again, here, um, sorry, I'm trying to get to the sheet. So um, if you are thinking of a specific um, partner that you want to partner with um, to share these um, recommended practices, or if your goal is to share this with families, um, we just um, felt this would be helpful for you to um, think through and kind of list your um, um, action plan. So it could be um, thinking about what your actual plan sh is going to look like. How, how will you measure that it is making an impact? How you can, um, how much can you commit to doing it? I know we are all, um, you know, stretched thin, trying to make sure that um, we meet our deliverables and deadlines and um, make sure that we are sharing the best information with our families. So um, how much can we commit to doing it? And do we have the information and resources we need to achieve um, uh, what we want to do? And do we, um, you know, is it doable? Is it, and does it align with what you're already trying to do in terms of family engagement? Um, you know, what, what is the time frame you're looking at? Do you want to do it, um, you know, just to, uh, you know, just immediately um, and start right away? Or, you know, is there a better um, way that you can um, structure it, you know, around a specific project or, a, or an activity that's coming up? So, um, so th this sheet is basically to help you think through this. You know, we know this is not going to be possible for you to um, uh, complete as we are speaking, but definitely something for you to um, use and consider as you're thinking through about uh, some of the um, activities that you would like to do to share the recommended practices. And we put this um, plan in the handouts that are uploaded to Whova for the conference, if you want to see that. So what we really got left for you is just the last couple of slides to wrap up. As we said, we gave you the links to the various tools and practice guides, um, performance checklists that we shared today. Um, I wanted to just make, I just wanted to add a comment to when you think about particularly the practice guides for families in English and in Spanish, um, think about those as there's so many, remember there's 66 of them approximately. Um, you wanna you know, really individualize and select what's right for each family. Um, some families can absolutely 
dig through 66 and digest and find what they need. Others need you to help them find the right one for their question. Um, tailor it to the parent's own style, their own preference, their learning needs. Um, if you've got someone perhaps who has um, maybe lower literacy level, that family practice guide full of words isn't going to work, but that video might be just the ticket. It might be exactly what they need to understand what people have been trying to explain to them, you know, using big words or paper handouts or whatever. So really think about the tools um, as something that you use as part of a conversation that you have with a family. And then turn them loose. Let them dig through, you know, and, and go crazy if that's their, you know, that's what works for them. But think about, think of it as part of a conversation and how you kind of individualize, just like you do with any family that calls you when they, you answer the phone, you listen to what their needs are, and then you make selections and decisions about how to share and what to share based on what they've said to you. So, so kind of just, that's my little word of caution as you, as you start to dig into the resource list. Um, and then with that, I think we just want to say thank you for joining us today. We definitely want to encourage you to complete the evaluation for our session. You can access the evaluation two ways. If you were using the Whova app on your phone, you will click on this session and then there's a little place with three little stars and it says um, rate it. And you just click that and it'll take you to the survey. If you were using your computer, um, it's on the left hand side of your screen and you'll go down to surveys and you'll select um, session feedback and take the survey and you'll find our session and, and complete it. So your feedback is really important to us. It helps us as we um, think about what we could do to improve this um, if we have the opportunity to share this kind of information in the future. And it's just helpful for us overall as the big conference evaluation. So again, um, we would just like to thank you for being with us today. Our contact information is all right there if you have questions.